Hello, I'm Mark Regev. And I'm Ruthie Bloom. And you're listening to another edition of Israel Undiplomatic. Please like and subscribe and leave us your comments at the end of the show. Ruthie, I, I know you watched Netanyahu's speech before the, uh, the joint session of Congress, his fourth such speech, which is, I believe, a world record. But what are your takeaways from what Netanyahu said? Oh, I have so many, but I'd like to start out by saying that I felt not only that the speech was spectacular, but I felt as an Israeli and a Jew, I felt pride. And I really saw this as a, a leader representing the Jewish people, not just the Jewish state. And I rarely feel that way. This was, this blew me away. Can I tell you, there's also something that I thought he made a special effort to do, that in speaking to an international audience, I don't think he tried to be partisan political Israeli. In fact, the sort of arguments he made, I think they're the arguments that like 85, 90% of Israelis uh, 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 can, can unite behind. I mean, he, he was Mr. Consensus last night. Well, you know something? He actually is Mr. Consensus. I mean, you wouldn't know that because of all the criticism uh, lobbed at him. But, you know, one of the reasons, one of the ways you can know that he's Mr. Consensus is that the left hates him and the right wing gets angry at him because he actually does represent the center despite these accusations that he's on the far right and all that. That's one thing. Uh, the other is that he was not there to represent a political party. He was there to appeal to the Western world and the United States in particular to uh, join forces to combat this awful threat from Iran. And he made a very serious point that Israel being on the front lines, we're the boots on the ground. They, Americans don't have to put soldiers on the ground. They just have to let us, as he said, finish the job quickly. And we need munitions for that. I think he made an interesting argument in that he focused on American national interest. In other words, he could have talked about we're a sister democracy and you should support us because we're a free country in the Middle East, which is, you know, we're the only democracy in the Middle East. Uh, he, he could have spoken to about values, but no. He addressed primarily America's national interest. Uh, and what's his point? Is uh, Israel's enemies are America's enemies. When Iran says, you know, death to Israel, the uh, next sentence is death to America. And I think he wanted to make that point because I think he understands the American today, especially the Donald Trump phenomenon, which is, you know, America first, make America great again, to understand, for, for his audience to understand that supporting Israel is not altruism. It's not doing the right thing. It's doing the smart, I should say, it's not only doing the right thing. It's doing the smart thing. Supporting Israel is good for America. And I think that was the central focus of his speech. And by the way, uh, you know, what actually hits home while he's saying those things is that in Washington, D.C., even at Union Station, the train station, there were uh, demonstrators pulling down American flags, replacing them with Palestinian flags, uh, writing Hamas and red letters, painting Hamas all over statues. You know, it, the fact is, it really is in America's interest to defeat this evil. And, you know, when Netanyahu said something like he doesn't, he doesn't understand how anybody could be siding at the moment with Hamas, um, these terrorists came in, they burned babies, they beheaded people, they raped women, they abducted hundreds, they uh, burned down homes. How can anybody side with that? And yet, as we've seen throughout this war, you have, and as I repeatedly say on this program, the left has married the radical jihadists. It's, an, it's a very peculiar marriage because, uh, you know, all the left-wing ideology is totally anathema to anything that goes on in Gaza. Well, he, he, he didn't say he was quoting Lenin, the father of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 in Russia, but he used the term useful idiots, which, which is how yeah. Lenin described people who were didn't understand what communism was all about, but were, would justify it. And, and I think he using the term on the protesters 
is very, very to the point, because I know that there are some of the protesters who are pro-Hamas jihadists and uh, are very proud to be pro-Hamas jihadists. But they're also part of the protesters who are just thinking, oh, this is good for peace or this is good for, you know, humanity and we're doing the right thing. And, and uh, Netanyahu, I think, uh, uh, said very correctly that what they're doing is wrong, what they're doing is immoral, and what they're doing is, 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 is simply idiotic. And I think the term useful idiots was well used. Well, it's perfect. And also, I have to say, sadly, and I hate to bring this up, but in Israel... There's a similar thing going on, which is to say you have the radical protesters, usually funded, very well-oiled machine and well-funded, who piggyback on other, now in America it's on other students, they use intersectionality as the uh, pretext, so it's human rights, women's rights, et cetera, et cetera, actually to further a very evil agenda. Now in Israel... It's more delicate than that, but there is also a concerted effort to piggyback on the um, on the hostage families. Um, there are there's a whole protest movement that really doesn't care about the hostage families, and we know that because any family of a hostage who doesn't uh, keep in lockstep with their ideology, they spit them out and they attack them and vilify them. What we know is these poor families are desperate to get their loved ones home. And some of them are already dead, and they're desperate to get their loved ones home for burial. Um, and the protest movement that was going strong well before October 7th has just sort of taken them over and tried to turn them into useful idiots in the attempt to vilify Netanyahu. I'd like to raise a, an American aspect of this, of, of what we saw in the speech to Congress, and that is the fact that sitting behind the Prime Minister when he was speeding should have been the President of the Senate, which is, of course, Vice President Harris. And she said she had another commitment, and it's true. But it was a baloney commitment, by the way. There are real commitments. This one was a really small, uh, inane one. So also, of course, the, the vice presidential candidate on the Republican side was also not there. He was also campaigning somewhere. But I think uh, uh, she made a mistake not being there. I think uh, she should have been there. And I'm trying to understand on the assumption that it was based on political advice that she received. I mean, her goal now is to unite the Democratic Party behind her and to present a united front against um, uh, Trump in the election. And I think someone told her, listen, the issue of Gaza, the issue of Israel, that's a divisive issue in Democratic circles. Democratic with a big D, of course, and that by being there behind him when he was speaking, and and if the pre, you know the 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 speaker of the house stands up and claps, and you don't, everyone will see that. And if you do stand up and clap, then everyone will see that too. Or like Nancy Pelosi, who when she was speaker of the house, ripped up a speech by Trump. Trump I remember that, yeah. <laughs> and but, it was all there; you could watch it on television. But I'm saying, I think. The advice her political handlers are giving the current vice president and, and future Democratic nominee, it's not official yet, maybe it will be soon, but but try to stay away from the issue. And I think, does that not show, I mean, traditionally we always said Israel-US relations are bipartisan. And Netanyahu spoke last night very strongly. Uh, uh, he praised Biden and he praised Trump. He was showing bipartisan, he even used the word itself during the speech. But is there not something going on in the Democratic Party which means that a, a, a leader of that party today, someone who's seeking to unite the party behind them, has to pander also to these anti-Israel groups? Well, it's not just also. I would say especially. And one of the things, when you say it wasn't, you thought it wasn't wise of her um, not to attend, well, it's sort of funny on whose part, wise or not wise. A, I think it was good that she didn't because... Anything that's transparent and we can see its motives, that's good. I think it's good for voters and it's good for Israel. You should know what the truth is. And if she had attended and clapped, and we wouldn't necessarily know. Now, we do know that she's a radical leftist. There's much evidence no. of that. Yes, During the primaries campaigns, uh, when uh, she stood against Joe Biden in, in 2020, uh, uh, the, the progressives 
didn't like her. They because didn't like they... her because she had been a prosecutor. A law and order Democrat. Right. She had been a law and order Democrat. Well, she isn't anymore. And I'll tell you something else. She, the, the, the vote in America doesn't go by the popular vote. It goes by states. Now, so it's not just that she has to, that she's pandering to the radical squad and, you know, Rashida Tlaib sat in the audience with this genocide sign looking like the idiot she is. And she's not a useful idiot. She's just an idiot and she's among those who use others. I want you to think of a, a different word than idiot because I don't think it's about her intelligence. It's about her beliefs. She is okay. a Palestinian she's nationalist. Ideologically, she is ideologically... Yeah. Uh, Evil, that, am I allowed to say evil if I'm not allowed to say idiot? No, that's too strong a word for you. Okay, I think it's evil to say that Israel's committing genocide in Gaza. How about that? I think uh, Hamas is evil and Israel is not evil and Israel is not committing genocide in Gaza. But okay, at least she was sitting there in the audience and again with a sign that says, this is who I am. And again, many Democrats did not clap even though, though they did attend. Some boycotted, some attended. The main point, though, is that Israel should be a bipartisan issue in the United States, of course. Um, over the years, the Democrats have pushed a wedge between uh, um, and made it more of a partisan issue and then blamed Israel for it, or more specifically, blamed Netanyahu for creating a wedge. Now, it is absolute nonsense. Netanyahu never created a wedge. He's been extremely... Um, um, deferential. He was to Obama, even though President Obama really made no bones about hating Netanyahu and being anti-Israel and saying, we want daylight in between America and Israel. Now, my point now is everything, there's upheaval in the United States. We, we This is an unprecedented situation. And a few hours after Netanyahu's speech, Biden made his own little speech uh, about why he had decided to exit the race. And I must say, you are looking at the leader of two leaders of two countries, America being the greatest, most important country in the world, and Israel also being crucial and all that. But still, Israel is a tiny country. America is the great America. And the comparison was just shocking. And I felt sorry for Biden because I have to say, again, they schlepped him out in front of the cameras and made him read a teleprompter that he could not I read. Don't think, I don't think we know that they made him do anything. I'm sure he wanted to do it. But what is interesting in what you're well, saying? Well, maybe he wanted to do it, but he was incapable of doing it. And he did it badly, even though it was short and even though what he was saying and everything. You could barely hear what he was saying. I want to say the following. Today's reality that there are elements within the Democratic Party which are hostile towards Israel. Um, uh, some are just critical and some are downright hostile. It's actually interesting if you look at it from a historical perspective because uh, the first president who recognized Israel is Harry Truman, a Democrat, who, who gives recognition to the Jewish state just hours yeah, uh, after Ben-Gurion declares independence in May 1948. And he actually takes pride. He writes it in his uh, autobiography of his years in office, and he, he writes about um, that he felt like he was like Cyrus, who allowed you know, the Jews to return from Babylon to reestablish their, their kingdom. And, and he's a Democrat. He's seen as a progressive Democrat, and he's the father of the Israel-U.S. relationship. He's the president that recognizes Israel against the advice of the State Department, against the advice of the Pentagon. He stood up for what he thought was right. Then throughout the 1950s, you have the Eisenhower administration, which is a Republican administration, which basically has this attitude that there's a Cold War going on, and if the United States hugs Israel too closely, then the Arabs will go into the Soviet side of the Cold War and will lose them as friends of the West. And therefore, like in 1956, during the Suez Crisis, America comes down like a ton of bricks on Israel and forces Ben-Gurion to withdraw from Sinai. Now, in the 1960s, you have two Democratic presidents, Kennedy and Johnson, both of them pushing back in a more pro-Israel dire direction. Uh, Kennedy is the first uh, American president to sell missiles, uh, the Hulk missile famously, to Israel. Johnson sells uh, aircraft and tanks for the first time. In other words, under Johnson, you see the beginnings of a military alliance. And so uh, the, it's actually interesting. 
it used to be that the Republicans were associated with the big oil companies and That's therefore right. the Arab world and so forth, and the Democrats who were into human rights and liberal values and a progressive world. Although, of course, it was Democrats who uh, were pro-slavery, let's not forget. All right. But okay, no, it depends how far you're going back. You're right that it used to be that way, but it hasn't been for a long time. And I'll tell you, in the 1960s, you mentioned the 1960s, the 1967 war in Israel, that was a cutoff point. That was when, up until then, you know, you could, all these uh, liberal lefties in America could be all pro-Israel and show it after 67, when all this talk about occupation, occupy, when Israel was victorious rather than a victim, Again, it, it began to seep in, and that is when, after that point, Israel started to become a wedge issue, um, that the idea was we had occupied all these territories, and since 67, there is the myth, A, that we're an occupying power, B, that we, are, uh, that we do nothing to make peace with the Palestinians, See that all we wanted were colonialists. I mean, the myths are rampant. And as it happens, today the Republican Party is also also sees Israel as a a, a um, symbol of Judeo Christian values that they share and they believe in the Bible and that Israel was given uh, to the Jews by God, etc. Um, and that's how the, this shift happened. But that not all Democrats are radicals, as you say. But where would you put Chuck Schumer? Chuck Schumer, who's Mr. Oh, look at me, I'm a good Jew, and my name means guardian and all that. He, a few months ago, he said, we have to oust Netanyahu. Who is he? This is a, this is a good Jew, this is a proud Jew, and he's interfering in Israeli politics. And everyone said, oh, isn't that wonderful that he finally acquiesced to have uh, Netanyahu come to speak to Congress. So you'll excuse me, I think Chuck Schumer can go you nowhere. So so Schumer's remarks back then when you said that he, he, he said Netanyahu had to go, they were unprecedented and they shouldn't have been spoken. Let's be clear, whatever you might mildly. think, whatever you think, right? Israel is a democratic country, it's an allied country to the United States. Mm -hmm. And for an American, a senior American politician to do what he, he said is, is, can you imagine him saying it about a British prime minister or a German prime minister or a French president? No, but he, he felt that he could say Or about a Palestinian leader. Can you imagine him saying it about a Palestinian leader? Well, George W. Bush said it about Arafat, but yeah. he's not a democratic leader. There's a and huge difference. Arafat finally, somebody acknowledged that he was an arch terrorist. That's I'm talking it, about yeah. Chuck Schumer right now. Right. Interesting, nobody mentioned... Uh, Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority, yeah, yeah, that's right. He's sort of not relevant, though he did write a letter to Trump this week, which we can talk about later if you like. I, I want to say something, though, because I think you said it's about Israel and 67 and the victory and, and, and occupation, yes, what, what, what Israel is accused of. But I'd remind you that in the late 60s, after that war, obviously, and in the early 70s when Golda Meir was Prime Minister of Israel, uh, she would go to uh, the United States, and she was a rock star. Uh, uh, and Democrats loved her because she was from Labour. She was a social democrat or a socialist. She was a woman in a world that was then predominantly a, a, a man's world. She was tough, and she was extremely popular. And if you actually listen to the, a lot of the Nixon Kissinger discussions, they were very careful with. Golda Meir, because they were concerned that she would galvanize, if they were too tough with Israel, that she could galvanize very effectively American public opinion for Israel, because she was such a rock star. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that, I mean, obviously... No, it's, but there's the key. You see, here's the key. When the Israeli left, okay, I, forget it. I know you don't like me to use this term, left and right, but the labor movement, the labor party, when that side of the spectrum in Israel and the same side of the spectrum in America were the same, they were all buddy-buddy, okay? You are forgetting. It is when, in 1977, when Menachem Begin became prime minister of Israel, oh, my God, all of a sudden, labor isn't the head of it. All of a sudden, you have Israelis and Americans accusing Begin of all kinds of terrible things. The point being that it's easy for Jews to love Israel when who's heading Israel is a Jew like them on the left. 
So I think you're wrong, and I want to explain why. <laughs> really? I'm so surprised. No, because I don't think that's the issue. Okay. I think the issue, if you look at these protests and these people in, in on university campuses and on city streets who say from the river to the sea, yes, they don't believe Israel has a right to exist in any border. Correct. That's something much more sinister. That's not about... I mean, in many ways, it's natural that a conservative in Israel feels comfortable with a conservative in the United States and that a liberal in mm -hmm. Israel feels li uh, with a liberal in the United States. That, and that's a legitimate discussion, and people can have their p political preferences. But if you've got people, yeah, Israel is illegitimate. Israel is apartheid. Israel is colonialist. Israel is imperialist. Israel yes. is fascist. Israel is they, you know, committing genocide, all right. these things. That's something very different. That's a hatred for Israel, and then it doesn't matter who's the prime minister here. It doesn't matter if it's Shimon Peres or Benjamin Netanyahu. There you're absolutely right. The trouble is that the Chuck Schumer types, okay, they say they don't feel that way. They don't feel that Israel should be wiped off the map. No. They think Netanyahu should be wiped off the map, and the trouble is that when you start getting into the, the weeds like that, you start siding with policies that actually are anti-Israel and have nothing to do with Netanyahu. It's dangerous territory, and we've seen it. And, you know, I have to say, we've seen that with our, the leader of our opposition, Yair Lapid, when he was briefly prime minister. He kept saying, I'm going to solve this whole wedge issue. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And the same thing with Naftali Bennett, the idea, and the same thing with Benny Gantz, who wants to be prime minister. They have a fantasy that if they, that if, if, since it's not Netanyahu, everything will be fine with the Democratic Party. But the trouble is that it's only fine when capitulating to them, when there's daylight, when they agree with o, an Obama platform. Then it is fine. Now, that's not in Israel's interest. So there, that's what I was trying to say. Of course, uh, it's not that everybody wants to annihilate the state of Israel. You know, I also think there's a mistake here that some of these uh, uh, people make. Once again, I'm talking about the people who say they're friends of Israel and they know better than the Israelis what's good for them. Yeah, you, th there's that sort yeah. of attitude. But I, I, I think, Ruthie, if, if we uh, look at the situation uh, uh, carefully, we can see that unfortunately there is part of you know, those people in the streets protesting outside the Congress. Uh, they are just blatantly hateful towards Israel. Israel, and there can be no excuse for it. Absolutely. And I have to say, Netanyahu, he managed in an hour to make every single important point that he needed to make because he spoke about the war. He spoke about October 7th first. He spoke about the war. He introduced victims of the war, released hostages, uh, wounded soldiers, parents of hostages still held. He also, he talked about Iran and the many fronts that we're uh, now fighting. He talked about everything. He talked about the explosion of anti-Semitism. He also, as you said, he thanked Biden profusely. He also thanked Trump. Very he bipartisan. Was, he was bipartisan. Although, again, you know, the Israeli press are going after him. Mm -hmm. They're saying... Can I tell you, I saw one of the television stations which tends to be critical of, of Netanyahu, very critical of Netanyahu, even they were praising his speech uh, last night. Uh, some commentators who never have a nice word to say about him. But I would say to those Americans who are uh, critical of Netanyahu and want to see him go, all right, maybe he will go. We don't know how this is going to play out politically. His numbers have not been good since October 7th. He's fighting back, yes, maybe there's been an improvement, but in no survey that I've seen since October 7th, even before, does the current ruling coalition have a majority? Now, that can change. Is uh, Polls are only a good on the day they're there. Right. But what I'm saying, to those people who think we get rid of Netanyahu and we solve all of the problems, it's a myth. Because if Netanyahu is having polit you know, political challenges since the war and he's got to fight his way politically back, mm. Netanyahuism, yes, the ideology that Israel has to be tough, Right. And the idea that, the, you know, we can somehow just pull out and hope for the best. Right. And a two state solution is there for the taking. All Israel has to do is be willing to show some flexibility. Israelis aren't there. So no. uh, while Net Netanyahu's political Netanyahu's political brand is not where it used to be. But Netanyahuism, what he stands for, I think you get a larger 
larger majority of Israelis supporting those principles. Look, I agree with you. I'll tell you something funny. If you want to make another America-Israel comparison, okay, you know, uh, there was this whole issue about how Biden, because he was slipping, there was no chance he could beat Trump in the November election. And then, oops, they got rid of him or, you know, pressured him out. To blah, blah. And suddenly it's Kamala Harris. OK, well, she wasn't popular before. But the idea was, oh, my goodness. I mean, she's also not popular in Israel. Here's an irony for you. Likud, I was talking to people about this. They say, no, it's not. It's just Netanyahu. It's just Netanyahu. You say, OK, fine. Okay, tomorrow, Netanyahu says, bye, I'm leaving. Guess who becomes prime minister of Israel if Netanyahu says, bye, I'm leaving? Yariv Levin, our justice minister. This is the guy who caused, I, I was for him, I still am, but whose judicial reform plans caused uh, everybody to go crazy and take to the streets. Not everybody, half the country took to the streets and began to protest. Why am I bringing this up? Because when they say it was just Netanyahu, I said, oh, really? And you, so in other words, if Yariv Levin is head of Likud, you'll be fine with the Likud-led government. And they say, oh, mm, well, no. When you finally pin it down, and this is why we will have another electoral impasse, as we did for five rounds of elections up until a year and a half ago. I, and so I think there is absolutely no point. I think any Israeli who thinks that this is a time now to have elections and topple the government is insane. So first of all, the government looks like it's stable. And as long as Netanyahu has that majority in the Knesset, he will continue to be prime minister until 2026 when we have to have our next general elections. Having said that, I have to tell you, the, the behavior of Itamar Ben-Gvir, the head of one of those right-wing parties that is part of the coalition during Netanyahu's visit, I thought was uh, terrible. It, he takes one of the most sensitive issues for Israeli national security, and he just plays with it in a way. If he would have said, yes, the prime minister doesn't believe this, but I believe, right? And he said, I'm going to, this is my position. It would have been fine. But what he said about the Temple Mount, that, you know, we have to change the status quo there, which is not the position of the prime minister. No, it's, it's not, not the position. position. And, and, no. and, and if, if he would have said, this is my opinion, but it's not the government. But he said, no, I have decided. I'm the, he said, you know, I'm the government. Very irresponsible, playing with fire. The prime minister wants Arab partners, when this is over, to help create a new reality of Gaza. A new reality in Gaza, a reality where Gaza, as he said, is no longer a threat to Israel, where Palestinians can have right. some sort of civilian control, but not people who hate Israel. And he believes there are Arab partners in that effort. The minute you start making noises about the Temple Mount, exactly, you're then the push, enemy says, the enemy know. says, you see, the Jews are trying to storm the Temple Mount. It was very irresponsible. But may I say again, I, it's not that I disagree with you, okay? But you know who else? Uh, behaves extremely irresponsibly and has been doing so uh, frequently, and that is our defense minister, Yoav Gallant, who goes behind Bibi's back uh, repeatedly, and also he also um, says things that are not in line with Netanyahu's policies or Likud. Now, he's a member of Likud. At least Itamar Ben-Gvir is not in the Likud party. I don't think it's so, a comparison because you can argue the politics of what the defense minister has said, right? And you can discuss is it right or wrong and is he making a political mistake? But to say something so uh, controversial about the Temple Mount has the ability to hurt Israel's national security. Uh, and I, I think know, it's, a, yeah, it's well, a different league of problems. And then he went and said, uh, uh, Trump is good for Israel. Now, you believe Trump is good for Israel. Many Israelis believe Trump is good for but Israel. But it's not his place it's to say It's not his that. place to say it as a government minister. Correct. It's not his place. And once again, he's showing either political extremism or political immaturity. Either way, is, right. is it possible, Ruth, i ask you a question, is it possible that this sort of behavior will in the end bring down the government? Well, it'll bring down the government if he exits the government, yes. I mean, that's the irony here. It's not that Netanyahu is going to kick him out or something. I mean, because if he okay, does, then the government well, maybe will fall. The, maybe he'll say something or do something that Netanyahu wouldn't maybe, have to. But then, but then the government will fall because yeah. he won't, we, the government won't have a majority. But I'll say one thing. I, I have to go back to Yoav Gallant. I'm sorry. You say it's not the same? Well, I'll tell you something. When our defense minister starts to say, well, we don't really need control of the Philadelphia corridor. Well, we can put sensors there, technology. I don't know. 
This makes me nervous, okay? We saw what happened with our technology on October 7th, and that's not, I need a defense minister who, who can say whatever he wants in private to the prime minister, but in public, all I wanna hear from him is, we're gonna win, we're beating Hamas, we have the capability of doing so, and, and we're not gonna stop until we do so. I don't wanna hear anything else from my defense minister, and it undermines the, the government, in my opinion, that's it. And that is why I'm not disagreeing with you about Ben Gvir, but you know, Yoav Gallant never, uh, you know, he's the darling. Because Why is he the darling? Because he, because the left thinks that he doesn't like Netanyahu, and so they are, they're keeping him protected. So I, there's no doubt, I'm not sure I'd use the word left, but the people who don't like Netanyahu. Okay, the anti-Netanyahu crowd. Yeah, they like, they like him because, he's the, because of his the tensions with the prime minister. And, uh, uh, and the truth is that's why Lieberman, look at Victor Lieberman. Yeah, exactly. They used to hate him, and then suddenly when he became a post in Netanyahu, everyone is, he's, exactly. he's a rock star, yes? Exactly. Uh, uh, that's, that's the reality. Israeli politics was polarized before October 7th. And unfortunately, we are still polarized very much today. But what's interesting and what can give us hope and confidence for the future, though the political echelon is polarized, and you could even say, to a certain extent, moving towards some sort of dysfunctionality if we're not already there today. But the Israeli people, and you say you see those young men and women doing their reserve duty and the soldiers in Gaza who are fighting, on the fundamental goals of this conflict, that we have to defeat Hamas, that they can no longer rule Gaza, that we have to do everything we can to get our hostages home, all of them, as the Prime Minister said in his speech. Absolutely. I think you find a massive Israeli consensus behind those goals. No question. Here, we finally found something to totally agree on. And with that, uh, we'll end for today. And again, please like, subscribe, and uh, send us your comments. Until next week. Pleasure being with you, Ruthie. Thank <laughs> you.